Good morning. I am back, and uh, as I do lead the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, I just wanted you to know that I was chosen for this role because I am, in fact, the embodiment of biblical manhood. <laughs> and thank you for the laughter. <laughs> Very affirming. Uh, immediate uproarious response is what I get when I say that line. Um, I'll let you be the judge of why. Um, I did want to say a quick word. Um, I want to invite everybody here, yes, all of you, to the CBMW pre-conference just before Together for the Gospel in a month's time. Ryan kindly mentioned this last night. I'll just say a quick word. We have John Piper, Alistair Begg, John MacArthur, Kevin DeYoung, Al Mohler, and about 30 speakers in total, including a number of leading women speakers, Mary Cassian, Mary Moeller, and uh, some others, Courtney Reisig, on Tuesday morning. This is the Tuesday morning before T4G, April 12th, 2016. So if you're coming to Together for the Gospel, come a day earlier and come to the CBMW pre-conference, and you'll hear more stuff like this which I am about to give. So consider yourself invited to that. We also have a website for you, cbmw.org, which has all sorts of resources featuring the kind of hopefully biblical take of the sort that you do not find on offer in the culture today. So if you want resources on manhood, on womanhood, on how to live these things out, there is an organization dedicated to these things founded by John Piper and Wayne Grudem in 1987. It continues today. Uh, we need partners, we need support, but we are charging ahead no matter what we get uh, in order to seek to equip out of love God's people and answer the hard questions the culture is posing to us. So do consider that as well. You know, we are indeed in a confused age. Last night, I mentioned that on Facebook now you have over 50 gender options. So you might have thought there were two, male, female, but you, my dear friend, are very much mistaken. In fact, I need to enlighten you as to some of the choices that are arrayed before you now in our brave new society. You could choose these, okay, if you wanted as a result of my talk. That would be a good outcome of me giving a talk on manhood and womanhood. <laughs> you could choose, for example, to be circ gender. This is actual, this is true. I'm not making this up, seriously. You could be circ gender. This is, as described on Reddit, a gender that feels so magical and grand as to be indescribable. So if you are feeling magical and grand this morning, just kind of wanting to spread your wings, stretch your arms out, turn to your friend, turn to your spouse and say, honey, I'm going circ gender. <laughs> I feel magical and grand. It's really indescribable. If, if you are feeling, uh, this is, wow, this is kind of serious. If you're feeling like you are closely related to demons and the supernatural, I don't know exactly how you sense that, but nonetheless, it's your grand project of self-construction, okay? So if you feel closely related to demons and the supernatural, you're dimogender, okay? You can choose that one. If you feel like you are a magical, whimsical gender, you could be metagender, okay? I, that seems to be something of a competitor to circ gender. I have no idea who's going to win in that battle. <laughs> and then finally, I referenced this previously, but if you... If you feel like you're not a man, you're not a woman, you're kind of a small cat-like person, you might be feelis gender, feelis gender, for those who feel like they conform to a small cat-like identity. Okay, this little survey of modern gender options, which by the way, people are taking very seriously today, is something that I think it is appropriate to look at and say, this is not sound, yes? But th <laughs> thank you for that response. <laughs> but, th <laughs> but thankfully, God's word is clear on these matters. We are not left to wonder whether we are cat-like or whether we are magical and grand so as to be indescribable. We are given two glorious realities, realities, essential truths about human identity in God's word. Uh, we are either a man or a woman. This is not to say that we cannot struggle with what is called gender dysphoria. Some people very much do struggle with this. It sometimes correlates, in a, in a good number of cases, with abuse. And we do, not, we do not laugh at that in any sense. 
We recognize that that is an effect of the fall. We, we recognize that we all, in fact, are called to own our God-given manhood or womanhood. You see David, for example, saying this to his son Solomon in 1 Kings 2.2, be strong and show yourself a man. That's a call not necessarily to overcome gender dysphoria, but it is a call to own your manhood. Or conversely, if he's speaking to his daughter, he might say, own your womanhood. The Bible itself has a category, by the way, for cross-dressing. It's not a positive one. Deuteronomy 22, 5 speaks against, directly, uh, cross-dressing. 1 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians uh, fills out this portrait and, and tells us that we are not to make up our gender identity. We are to own that which God has given us. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, and so you can find that. There's a, there's a synchronicity, in other words, in the full biblical picture in which we are called from start to finish to embrace as a gift, not as a uh, reality we have to, I guess, affirm, but no, to embrace as a gift, manhood and womanhood. You may not have thought in these terms before, but these are realities that the church, by virtue of the culture pressing in, is called to own and gladly receive as the gift, hear me very clearly, the gift of God. This isn't a a project in which we're seeking to cast stones at people who aren't like us. If somebody does struggle in this room with gender dysphoria, we have grace to offer you. We seek to call you Uh, to Christ, and we recognize that in calling you to Christ, we will call you ultimately to own your God-given manhood and womanhood. And yet, these are realities that we're going to be facing more and more in days ahead. This isn't going to be something exotic that our churches face. This is something that is here on our doorstep. These gender options are being embraced, especially by young people today. And you, you need to be equipped on these matters. You need to be ready to give an answer. The gospel and gender are not separated from one another. When you are saved by Jesus Christ, you are called, as I said, to own your human identity, your God-given identity. So this is, this is a, a layout for what is to come in my talk. In what follows, I simply want to give you seven thoughts on complementarity, okay, biblical complementarity. Uh, from start to finish, Scripture teaches the complementarity of the sexes. God creates Adam and Eve, Genesis 2 and 3, and yet uh, Adam and Eve are not the same. They are one in the sense that they are image bearers, as we discussed last night. They are each equally the image of God. One is not more than the other. There's not a slight percentage uptick for one sex or the other. Both the man and the woman are the image of God, and yet they are not the same. There are distinctions between them, and these distinctions do not owe to a genetic accident, does not owe to blind evolutionary processes. These, distincts, these distinctives excuse me, owe to the very mind of God. It is God who has created the sexes. He has created the sexes for his own glory. God loves, you could say from the start, diversity. He's not scared of it. He's not shy about it. He's not trying to make everybody look the same. He wants distinct sexes to glorify him in this world. And so that's what we speak of when we talk about complementarity. We are united in terms of being image bearers, but we are not the same, and we have distinct roles even in the home and the church as we will see in what follows. So seven points, that's the framework for this talk, and we want to dive in now. We have much to cover. First, complementarity shows us what we were made for. So the complementarity of the sexes, sometimes they're called the genders, but that's a less strong word than the sexes, which can sound a little strange, I admit. Sexes speaks to hard and fast biological realities that God has made, ultimately. You find the groundwork for complementarity, for the formation of the man and the woman in Genesis 2. Turn with me in your Bible, open it up on your app. Genesis 2, I'm going to read selections, and we're going to have to move rapidly because we have so much to cover. Genesis 2 verse 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust, formed the man of dust from the ground, excuse me, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Right off the bat, you see that Adam is created by God 
The biblical portrait in Genesis 2 is that he is the direct creation of Almighty God, something that I think we should mark when we're talking about the work of creation. And we note as well that uh, the man has a purpose in being formed. He's supposed to be in the garden of Eden in the east. This is where God wants him to be, and it's implicit that God wants him to work. So coded into his identity is that of a worker right off the bat. Let's move ahead to Genesis 2 verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. We find a tremendous amount of biblical material about gender or about the sexes, about complementarity of the sexes from this passage. The first not good aspect of creation is Adam's aloneness. Adam, uh, the, the text says, according to the Lord God himself, needs an Isaiah in the Hebrew, a helper, one who can support him and bless him in unique ways as he fulfills God's mission. Already off the bat, if you were to share this with a, a secular feminist, they might have issues with the biblical witness because they would say to be a helper for a woman indicates that she has a subordinate identity. The scripture actually has a very different understanding of helping. God himself in certain places in the Old Testament is described as a helper. A helper is actually somebody who is needed. Do you see this? It's not somebody who is made to be dominated or to be used or simply to stand by the side and nod approvingly at everything Adam does. A helper is somebody who provides unique skills that Adam does not himself bear, right? God creates the woman out of a lack for Adam. This isn't to get into some sort of, you know, they're, they're each 50% whole before the other is made. Adam is a fully functioning human being made by God before Eve comes on the scene. But it is to say that Eve is called to this role that Adam is not called to. Adam is nowhere called a helper in the biblical witness, and this is an identity marker for the woman and for women from this textual basis. Now, of course, this identity of helper comes first in the context of marriage for Adam and Eve, and we would say the same today, but we should note that this pattern this pattern is telling us something about the way God desires men and women to relate. Adam has been appointed by God to be the head, effectively, of this home, the leader of this pair, and he, and, and he desires that Eve would work beside him and, again, fill these essential tasks that he himself cannot complete. So we start in the biblical mind with distinctive roles and even identities between the sexes. This is not where our culture starts. Our culture starts, as we talked about, in terms of a quick survey of paganism last night, by making everything the same. Have you seen this? You can no longer in the public square seemingly identify one, uh, one, one desire, one undertaking as that which only men would do or that which only women would do. You have to include everybody in everything. There's not supposed to be any distinctions between the sexes today. Now, there can be harmful distinctions between the sexes, but in the Scripture, God makes the sexes unique. He does not ask them to pretend that they are the same. He asks them to fill different but complementary roles, and thus there is no competition between the sexes. There's no anger. There's no enmity. That will all result from the fall but the man at this point in Genesis 2 is not seeking to overtake the woman, and the woman is not seeking to dethrone or displace the man. They are in harmony. They fill these God-made roles for his glory. All is good. This is Eden. This is Eden. Complementarity begins in Eden, and we need to mark that carefully. The man exalts over this woman. This woman is made from his body. Verse 22, the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. Here's what, here's what God is indicating, is communicating to Adam by virtue of this physical detail. Every time Adam looks at his wife, 
He is supposed to think, she was made for me. He is supposed to think, my body gave existence to her. There is no way I could ever use this same body, therefore, against her. That's what God is, commu- God is communicating something powerful to the man by virtue of this detail. So already off the bat, even before the fall, God has already signaled to Adam that he is to treat the woman with tenderness and love, empathy, gentleness. He is, he is to recognize that she is in a real way dependent on his body for existence. There is a symbiosis and interconnectedness between the sexes that will take you fully aback and knock you on your seat when you read it for the first time in the Bible because you are not used to this if you have been indoctrinated and educated by a secular culture. You have been told that the sexes are not interconnected, and they are. They depend upon one another. The woman is going to become a child bearer, and thus every man who's ever born, right? Here, here's a profound rebuke to misogyny, right? To men, you know, being unkind to women. Every man who's ever been born has been born of a woman, okay? So that's infinite grounds for never treating a woman roughly, never thinking yourself superior to her. The created order is good, and it is good for us, and it brings joy. In verse 23, Adam exults in this woman, this at last, he says. He he shouts this. He's not speaking in a monotone when the woman is brought to him. God designed this woman. God made her. God made her frame. And Adam finds it beautiful. He finds it intoxicating. And, And so there is this harmony between the two. This is what marriage, this is what Uh, The sexes are made for. They are made for this kind of harmony and joy. God makes the man strong to work. God makes the woman with the capacity of bearing children. We can say it this way. There's tremendous potential spring-loaded into manhood and womanhood. Both. Both are made for a purpose. Both are made to share in the dominion mandate that we talked about last night. But again, both are not the same. They will fulfill the dominion mandate in ways that overlapped, but also in ways that are unique to the sexes. The Lord, you could say it this way, has not made us Teletubbies. <laughs> we are not androgynous creatures that have become the gospel uh, nameless and faceless beings of the earth, okay? We're not gospel androgynous people. We are, we are men or we are women. And when we are redeemed, That is not lost. Galatians 3.27 does not mean that manhood and womanhood cease when you come to faith in Christ. Galatians 3.27.28 following mean that there are no, there are to be no sinful boundary markers between the sexes or between Jew and Gentile or between slave and free. That text does not mean, as you will hear, that the sexes no longer matter and thus gender roles dissolve in a kind of Jesus uh, pudding. That is not the case. The Lord, that came out of nowhere. The Lord wants us, (laughs) I've never said or thought that phrase. (laughs) Okay, back on track. The Lord wants us to seize our inborn potential as a man or a woman for his glory again. You, you yourself are not a genetic accident. You are not a bioevolutionary fluke. You are a man or woman because God wanted you to be. Okay, moving on. Second, complementarity helps us understand our sinful instincts as men and women. Genesis 3 verse 1, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? As God had indeed said in Genesis 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, here it is, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, rebuking the word of God. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves 
loincloths. Here, Satan subverts the created order. A beast takes dominion over the, the woman and the man. Satan addresses the woman first. He targets women. Satan has always been after women. It's not men who have been after women from the start. It's Satan. It's Satan who wants to obliterate womanhood. I do not know the mind of Satan precisely. Uh, I suppose Satan knows that if he gets the woman, he's going to poison the fruit of all mankind, right? Because the woman gives birth to children. Satan targets women. Satan wants women not to follow the word of God. He always has. He has always been whispering at them, to disobey God and distrust God's word. Guess what? We're in the same context. We're in the same culture. We are in a time, in a season, even in an evangelical moment when women are sorely challenged to own the full spectrum of God's teaching on womanhood as good. Now, you need to set the mark, women, exactly where Scripture has it. You're not trying to outdo Scripture. You're not trying to underplay Scripture. You in Christ, want to know what God has for you as a woman. You don't want to be led off by the serpent. The serpent wants you still. He wants to destroy you. And the way he destroys you, to be very clear, is to get you to disobey the word of God. The the stakes, the stakes are very high, are they not? They're very high. It's remarkable that Satan does not go to Adam first. Adam, of course, has abdicated his responsibility to step up and protect his wife. She is made from his rib. He is the one who is called to lead. She is his helper. He is the one who's supposed to shield his helper, and he does not own this role. And so the fall takes place. They eat of the forbidden fruit. Here is the ground, brothers and sisters, for all gender confusion, dysphoria, sexual brokenness, and personal rebellion. It starts now, Genesis 3. All the fights All the bitterness in a marriage, back and forth for days, weeks, months, perhaps years. All of it starts here, here in the fall. It doesn't start when Christianity imposes a kind of Victorian vision on men and women, a sort of John Wayne kind of cowboy manhood on the church. That's not where where sexual brokenness starts. That's not where tension creeps in. It's when Satan tempts Eve because Adam has not protected Eve. His wife. And the Lord is not blind to this, is he? he? He's aware of what has happened. Genesis 3, verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the fruit of the tree? which I commanded you not to eat. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me. You already know what I'm going to (laughs) say. She gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord addresses the man first following the fall, which indicates to you that this man was called to leadership of his wife. You see that? Verse 9, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? In the the Hebrew, it's singular. Where are you? It's not where are y'all, and to use the southern colloquialism. (laughs) It is where are you? And Adam finally answers. Adam finally acts and speaks up, tells him he's afraid, and then blame shifts for the first time. Verse 12, the woman, so it's the woman's fault right off the bat. There we go whom you gave to be with me. It's God's fault. (laughs) Truly. I don't say that for humor. The the man, this this is where sinful manhood begins. This is the first fruitage of it, I should say. This, This is the man having failed to lead, God indicating this, Yahweh indicating this by addressing him, not Eve, but the man. And the man first blaming the woman when it's not initially her fault, and then secondly blaming God. Blaming God. So here, as we talked about with Satan targeting women, women 
women being tempted to follow Satan's words over God's. Here's the man's initial outworking of the fall. Men are going to not take responsibility. Men are going to... Men are going to offer up all sorts of intricately woven excuses for why things are falling apart, for why they are trapped in sin, for why their family is not thriving spiritually, for uh, why things aren't going the way that they were supposed to go. Men are going to be tempted to be just like Adam, our father, Adam. You have to know this, men. This is, this is coded into you because of Adam's sin, because of the imputation of his guilt. You have a fallen nature because of Adam, even as all women do, and so you are going to be tempted to do this as well. Each member of the marriage blames someone else, Adam blaming both God and his wife, as I have said, and from all this comes terrible suffering, comes the giving of the curse. Genesis 3.16 indicates that the woman is going to have pain in childbearing. I think we can bear out that that has proven true. And then secondly, her desire will be for her husband. There's a linkage here uh, in Genesis 4 where uh, Yahweh speaks to Cain and says that sin's desire is for you. It wants to master you. In other words, it wants to rule you. The woman is going to want to rule her husband and take leadership of the family. This is an effect of the fall. The man is now going to work under the curse. In pain, you shall eat of the ground, the fruit of the ground, Genesis 3, 17. So the man is called to work. He was called to work initially. He doesn't get this role by virtue of the fall, but now his work is cursed. Satan has disrupted the order of creation, and he has disrupted the roles given to men and women. This is why you can't talk about the fall without reference to the sexes. This kind of gender-neutral Bible that many evangelicals have operated with for decades doesn't work. The fall... The fall owes to the breakdown of God's design for men and women. For the first marriage, which is the first institution of society, as I'm sure Andrew will be talking about later today, you can't approach the Bible like it doesn't treat men and women much, maybe a few places. No, the fall itself owes to to a disobedience against God's teaching for men and women. That's not to say the Bible is solely consumed with the sex is it clearly is not. There's a whole panoply of doctrine to handle. But this is core stuff, isn't it? These are the first pages of the Bible. This is, this is the explanation for evil in the world. So many men, many men are going to be tempted to be overbearing against their wives. Uh, men are also profoundly going to be tempted to abdicate their responsibility in the home, which I think is the massive problem in our day. I've been an elder of a church. We saw both problems. We saw far, far uh, more men failing to step up and lead the family in any kind of uh, defined spiritual direction. We need to move on. Third, complementarity not only describes what has gone wrong with humanity, second point, complementarity provides us with a script for our lives. Many men and women have lost sight of the script. They don't know what they are called to be. The Bible tells us much about what life looks like in Christ as a man or a woman. I'm going to get to Ephesians 5 in just a minute, but very quickly, if you are a Christian, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, believing in His vicarious death and resurrection on your behalf and have confessed all your sin to God and repented of all of it, You are born again, and you are a Christian, and now you are called, again, not to a gender-blind kind of faith, but to life as a redeemed man or a redeemed woman. And the Bible has much to say about what what these different lives look like. Women know that they are called to have a gentle and quiet spirit, for example, in 1 Peter 3, 4. That's that's called uh, of wives, and that takes expression in a marriage. I think it it extends even beyond that as a, as a godly woman is training her daughters. She doesn't know what God has for her daughters, but she's training them in the pattern uh, of a godly woman, of a godly wife, if God would call her daughters to that. So women are called to have a uniquely feminine spirit. That doesn't mean a woman has no personality, doesn't 
raise her voice in conversation or something like this, it does mean that there is something distinctive about biblical womanhood that you can't explain away. It's there in Scripture. Women are called to be a worker at home in Titus 2.5. That's a script. If God gives you a husband and gives you children, you're called to be an oikonergos in the Greek. Paul invents a word. That means that a woman is to see her primary vocation as raising children. It's hard work. It's, it's brutal work some days, but it's the most important work there is in all the world in natural terms. This is a script. This is something that helps you understand who you are called to be if God calls you to the family, to marriage. In the New Testament, we see women supporting the apostles financially, wealthy women. This is not often talked about, but many women help bankroll the apostles. Women are those who are the first witnesses to Christ's resurrection. Women serve in hospitality ministries. Women help disciple young believers and much, much more. The Bible gives women the green light to use their gifts and abilities on behalf of the church and the greater glory of God according to the wise design and teaching and plan of Scripture. Women, of course, are not called to be elders, pastors, teachers in the church, according to 1 Timothy 2.9, in the sense that they instruct the mixed church, the, the general church. Women very much are called to Titus 2, women, uh, Titus 2 ministry, excuse me, where women would teach other women. This is definitely what women are called to. Men, too, are given a script for their lives by Scripture. The plan of God for most men is to leave father and mother to not stay in the basement. Uh, <laughs> tempting as the basement may be. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, there are seasons, of course, where a young man is trying to find out what he is called to do. We understand that. We get that. He, he may be seeking to be married, but he's not married yet. We have compassion for that, of course. But there is a plan here. There is a call. We read it. Genesis 2, 24. A man stepping up, finding his courage praying for a wife, and then when one comes into view, hopefully, he summons forth aforementioned courage and seeks to win her heart. God does not want the sexes to languish as they currently are in our culture, the marriage age creeping up every year. Now it's something like 30 for men and 28 for women. It used to be 22 and 20. I mean, this is precipitous, massive social change. God wants young men not to not to waste away in their 20s, not to suffer, really, in a sense, in their 20s. He wants most men to win a woman's heart and begin a family. He might, a young man might say, but I'm not mature enough. It's a big part of how you become mature. <laughs> you, you get married. You guys are giving me way more laugh lines than I thought I had. <laughs> I... I <sighs> Preparing to be a husband and father is committing yourself to holistic growth. This is what young men need. They don't need to hear that marriage might be, if they're, I don't know, 10 or 12, you know, 25 years down the line. They need a father who is preparing them to be a godly husband and father. Now, he doesn't know if, if God's plan will involve marriage. Uh, hear me clearly. But a father, a good godly father, does not let the culture raise his child. Good godly father does not even ask a, a great youth pastor to raise his son. Good godly father takes his boy aside, trains him to know the Lord, loves him, teaches him godly character, teaches him what it means to be a man in biblical terms with all that entails, and sets out to win that boy to the Lord. Any father who is doing that is, is helping pass down what our culture desperately needs, this chain of manhood, because men are called to lead. It is the man who is called to leave family and find a wife and build that family and lead that family for the glory of Christ, according to Ephesians 5. That's a man's call. And so, fathers, you might think, what am I doing as a Christian? Nobody knows my name. Nobody's podcasting me. You know, this, I'm not some big deal. CT isn't doing a profile of me. Do you have a son? Do you have daughters? You, you, are, you are hereby invested with eternal work. So it is with wives and mothers. You have profound work. You have more work to do than you ever could do. The good news is the gospel is sufficient for these things. The good news is, even if you have not had a godly father, 
train you. If you will come into the church and you will submit to its teaching, young men, and you will learn from godly men in the church, put yourself under their authority, and you will seek to grow and to learn God's script for manhood, the Lord will take those years that the locust ate and he will redeem them. This is God's promise in Christ. If you have a, if you have a sordid past, a past so rough you don't want to share it with fellow believers, you can know that God has cast that in Christ into the greatest depths of the ocean. And all things are new in Jesus. So there is no excuse, none, for you passing on a culture of abdication of manhood in your home. The Spirit will make you sufficient for these things, even if your earthly father did not. Men should not crave, boys should not crave celebrity, athletic renown. We want to raise our boys to look at elders like they do LeBron James and Steph Curry. We want our boys to go, oh, that's an elder of our church <laughs> when, when they walk by. Because that's what true manhood is. It's not benching huge amounts of weight. It's not killing monsters in fantasy worlds and then saving the game. It's not about drawing female attention. True manhood is about drawing near to God. It is about the continual battle to forge disciplined habits so that you kill sin and you run without an anvil of guilt on your back. True manhood is about treating women well. It is about seeing them as sisters. It is about approaching them with absolute purity. 1 Timothy 5, 2. Think about that phrase, men. Absolute purity. That's the call for every man who is in Christ. Not a lot of purity, not mostly purity, not the youth group question. How much sin can I commit and I'm still okay as a Christian? You, you get that uh, frequently. No, the Bible standard is absolute purity. If you are trapped, if you are trapped in habits of pornography, addiction to the flesh, you need this word. You don't need somebody to tell you how magnificently broken you are in Jesus and it's all okay. You need somebody to tell you that Jesus, Jesus will wash your sin clean, but that he calls you to this standard. And he gives you the power in his spirit. Romans 8, 37, he makes you more than a conqueror in Christ over anything. That's the word you need. Not to be, not to be told that you're going to be okay. You can kind of keep sinning, but not a lot, but kind of. No, you need, you need a zero tolerance approach to sexual sin. That's what every church needs today. Too many churches do not hold this out to men. They tell men it's kind of okay to mess around with this. It's not okay. We are sinful men. We are. We will fall. But we need God's grace to call us back to biblical standards, back to holiness, and restore us along those lines. True manhood in terms of outworkings is about learning to budget, <laughs> taking dominion of your life, in other words. It's about grooming yourself. I'm happy to announce that. Though I do think you can grow an MMA beard. Uh, it's about true manhood, I think, at some level, is about, as an implication, it's about looking someone in the eye when you're talking with them. It's about chivalry. What used to be called chivalry? It's not dead. Holding the door for women, treating women better than you treat yourself, not being selfish, not putting yourself before women, but using your body and your strength, your manhood, for the good of women. We are not like the culture. We are not in a zero-sum game between the sexes where only one side wins and the other loses. We believe that God calls men to lay their lives down for women and children in the image of the crucified Christ, Ephesians 5, to 33. This means that we voluntarily inconvenience ourselves so that others can stay dry, warm, safe, protected. This means that as men, again, we take dominion of our spiritual lives. We pray regularly. We read the Bible, God willing, daily. We serve the body of Christ. We plug in. We find a place to serve, whether it be eldership, deaconship, or not. We find a place to serve. The Bible calls men to be something greater than they naturally would ever be. The Bible does not say that men are goofballs, idiots, animals, as the culture tells us. Watch commercials today. The Bible says that men are noble, noble beings. And if you, if you have been told that you're an animal, an idiot, a goofball, here's the good news. You can rise from those ashes in Jesus Christ. 
and that is your call. All this perspective that I have outlined owes to what we call gender essentialism as opposed to gender constructs. The Bible presents us with womanhood and manhood as core concepts, as essentially fixed realities uh, defined by the Lord himself. But here's what the culture tells us, okay? The culture believes that gender is a construct. It's a fiction. It's something people have ginned up this kind of mirage the church and others have created where you have sort of fixed manhood, fixed womanhood. So here's what we hear today. We hear that your gender identity and your body may not be the same. You may have the body of a man, but the gender identity of a woman. And I am here to tell you that is a lie. That is not the case. God's, God's design is good. God made your body. Your body is not lying to you. You may feel like it is but it's not. There's a script for your life in your bodily form, even. The culture says that society, the church, is to blame for confusion about gender roles. And I would say, no, it is the sin of Adam that is to blame for confusion about gender roles. The culture says that there are no hard and fast gender identities, and thus there are no hard and fast gender roles. And we say the Bible clearly and unequivocally teaches that there are certain ways that God desires the sexes to function in the home, the church, and as that is worked out beyond. The culture tells us that there is no underlying morality or design or intent for your body or your person. Again, the culture, though it doesn't know this necessarily, is pagan. It doesn't think there's any divine design. That's why it blurs the genders. That's why transgender ideology is advancing so rapidly. Because in elite colleges and universities, secular schools, gender theorists have told everybody that there's no hard and fast gender identity. There's no hard and fast gender roles. Guess what? Our culture's believing it and operating by it. The Bible clearly teaches that there is an underlying morality in our bodies. If, if we are called to any kind of sexuality, sexual expression, it is only in the context of covenantal marriage. That's what Scripture indicates even in that passage we talked about, Genesis 2, 24 and 25. We need to continue. Fourth, complementarity tells us what our marriages most need. I, I think of Ephesians 5, this glorious passage, the Bible's capstone passage on marriage. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. There is what we talked about with Adam looking at Eve and thinking, part of my body made her. That's, that's essentially what Paul is commenting on here. It's kind of a midrash on that reality. The single greatest component to marital happiness is not, not compatibility. People worry a great deal today about compatibility. Are we compatible? There's a spectrum of compatibility, let it be said. Some, are, some couples are more or less compatible in natural terms. But here's the deal. Because of Adam's fall, none of us are compatible. Every marriage, every marriage, even those that are between two Christians, is still affected by the curse. Do not stress yourself out, I would say, over compatibility. Here's what I would encourage you to zero in on like a lion seeking its prey. Complementarity. Defined here in Pauline terms. A wife, a wife giving great concern to honor apostolic uh, guidance here and submit to her husband, not just at the highest level, not just in where the family's going to move, what job he's going to have to provide, but also in the small stuff. That's what Paul says, that's what Paul says helps put on display a picture of the gospel. And a husband, a husband much more than worrying about some sort of psychological trait or background reality of his wife needs to give great concern 
to loving his wife as Christ loved the church. What an incredible call that is. Husbands, we are called to love like Jesus. There is so much, there is so much bound up with that reality, that biblical teaching. Again, the world worries about compatibility. What I want you to zero in on, if you are married, is not so much uh, your differences here, your differences there. You sort those out, but you sort them out according to biblical roles. Th- this has not been outmoded. Paul is not sort of erring away from the biblical design. He's not patriarchal in a sinful way such that he's outstepped the Holy Spirit. This is what every nar- marriage needs. This is what your marriage needs. This is what my marriage needs. First and foremost, before we get to working on how we communicate better, which we do, before we get to uh, where we go on vacation, <laughs> before we get to love languages, we go to those places. We seek to love one another personally and well, don't we? But first, we try to, we try to honor the design of God and ground our marriages there. Fifth, complementarity drives us to invest in the church's future. Briefly, we Do not sit back and wait for perfectly formed future elders of the church to pop up like toast. (laughs) Complementarity tells us that men, according to 1 Timothy 3, according to Titus 1, according according to 1 Timothy 2, men are called to be elders in the church. That doesn't start when a man is 37. As I said earlier, as I mentioned quickly earlier, that starts when you're training boys in your home. That starts here in this church for boys that don't have a godly father. And you train those boys here and now what it means to be a godly man. It's not enough to talk about being a generic Christian. It's not enough. You need, not in an overheated foaming at the mouth way, but you need to teach boys and girls You desperately need to teach them, already because of the biblical call, but even more so now in a transgender age. You need to teach boys and girls what it means to be a man and a woman. If you don't, the culture will. It will gladly step in and speak for you. Do you know this? Their peers will be very glad to share all sorts of horrible things about what it means to be a man and a woman. The Bible's design for men and for women is the great, it is the great dread foe of sin and competition and fighting between the sexes. There is no more powerful rebuke to abuse, for example, in the home than for a man to be a Christ-like head. If ever a phrase, if ever a word, head, leader, has been modified profoundly, it is there. Christ-like head. All that we need to fight domineering spirit in a, in, on the part of a man is already loaded into Ephesians 5 and other texts in the Scripture. We simply need to teach these things. You have, to, you have to flesh this out to your sons, to your daughters. You cannot teach them that they are gender-neutral Christians. You have to train them according to biblical design. And you have to train them, Titus 2, uh, as younger women as well. It is essential that older women teach what is good, Titus 2, verse Four, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Sometimes people say to me in my role with CBMW, do you believe women can teach in the church? Is that okay? And I say, if a woman isn't teaching in the church, that church is unbiblical. Titus 2 indicates that older women are to be training younger women in what godly womanhood looks like. Now, this isn't a kind of mirror eldership. Men are called to the teaching authority of the church. But this is a vastly important undertaking in every local church. This is an extra credit. This is essential in God's church that older women train younger women to be godly. Is this happening here? Is this happening in your church? I assume it is. I pray that it is. I know it's happening all over the place, but let it only happen more. Sixth, Script, uh, complementarity speaks a better word about sex than secularism. We're in a 50 shades of gray kind of culture where it's now seen as good, apparently, that uh, a man and a woman live out whatever sexual interest they have and that a man even essentially abuse a woman. 
in this kind of relationship. I'm going to try to keep it uh, as broad as I can and not go into details there. This is presented as good. People turned out in droves to this movie and put this book, Fifty Shades of Grey, and its sequels on the bestseller list for months, years. This is live stuff. This is live ammo in the culture. People think this stuff is good. Young people especially. You, you, do you know that young people on college campuses are not thriving? Here's a recent headline in USA Today. Students flood college counseling offices. Here's what the American Psychological Association has recently said. In the 2010 National Survey of Counseling Center Directors, respondents reported that 44% of their clients had severe psychological problems. In a 2010 survey, 45% of students surveyed reported feeling that things were hopeless. Why does basically half of the culture feel like life is not worth living? It does not only owe to a sexualized culture that has lost sight of any script of morality, but it surely relates. Young people on college campuses are the ones who, who have been told that the only thing you need present in a sexual encounter is consent. And guess what? Those same students who operate by these principles to some degree are flooding counseling offices. Here's what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters. We have a better word than the culture on sex. Do you know this? We have to preach this. We have to celebrate it. The biblical vision of sex is grounded in complementarity, a covenant marriage between a man and a woman that images, even in a small way, the greater gospel love of Christ for his church. Seventh and finally, complementarity helps us appreciate the goodness of God-given singleness. The head of the church, the head of God's church, is a single man, Jesus Christ who never married, never had sex, never knew the joys of tousling his boy's hair, never played catch, never cozied up with his little girl, you know, to hug her. He had no inside jokes with a spouse. He had no companion to lay beside at night. He had no bride, earthly bride, with whom to savor the big and small things of life. None of it. He was lonely for some of his life. The Bible indicates that. It was a tough call that he responded to. Yet, Jesus was the happiest man on earth because he was in the center of his Father's will. He was after his Father's kingdom and about his Father's business. Single men and women, you do not become a full-fledged person or Christian by being married. You already are. If you are single, and God has called you to this. You must not hear talks like this and like the one Andrew will give on marriage and think that's a condemnation of you. That's not at all what it is. It's celebrating biblical teaching, answering the claims of the culture, trying to glorify God. But you must know, according to 1 Corinthians 7, that your life is a good life. God has called you to it. It's Jesus' life. It's the Apostle Paul's life. Single men and women have the opportunity to live a set-apart life for Jesus Christ, and even in our age to demonstrate to the culture that sex is not that which fulfills. It is Christ who is all. Let me conclude with this. Our culture has very much demeaned manhood and womanhood. It has worked hard to undo this kind of teaching. This teaching will never die in the church because it is of God's word. I am fully confident of that. Wherever the gospel goes, this teaching on complementarity will go by God's grace. But occasionally our culture does get a little picture, a little a reminder of just how important it is for men to be men and women to be women. Last summer in Paris, on a train into this great city, the City of Lights, an Islamic terrorist stood up in the middle aisle. He was strapped to the gills. He had multiple guns, he had multiple knives, and he was there on this train to kill innocents for Allah and thus win great glory in paradise. Uh, a young guy, a young American soldier by the name of Spencer Stone from the West Coast was sleeping on the train at the same moment that this gunman, would-be gunman, stepped up, ready to mow down dozens, probably hundreds of people. Spencer Stone's friend, who he was traveling Europe with, nudged him when he saw this guy with guns and said, go. They just instinctively reacted 
to this terrorist who's going to cut them down where they stand. And Stone, this big, burly guy, runs down the aisle and bear hugs this terrorist. He's the only one who did so. According to news reports, French authorities fled. It makes sense that they would flee. This guy was loaded for bear, but Spencer Stone did not. He held on as the gunman attacked him, stabbed him in the neck, nearly cut off his ear, nearly cut off his thumb. Stone is bleeding from numerous places on his body. Finally, fellow passengers, two other Americans and, a, and a, an English guy, join Stone, and they together, this guy's probably hopped up on drugs. He's out of his mind, this terrorist, I mean, and they, they subdue him, finally. In the, in the process, the gunman does manage to shoot another passenger in the neck. Stone, after the gunman is subdued, reaches over and staunches the bleeding in this man's neck, even as he himself is losing consciousness. And all the world, as, as news reports came out, gaped at this display of manhood where a man used his strength, not against people, but to save them and paid a terrible price for it. He, he was in the hospital for days and days before he was released. The French government honored him with its highest civilian medal. Why do I say this? Because brothers and sisters, we are called to recognize that the sexes are good. God has designed them for his glory. God wants men and God wants women in Jesus Christ, far more importantly than any heroic episode like this. He wants men and women to step up and live for his glory as citizens of his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be Christ-captured men and women. I pray that we would live out this vision of gospel manhood and gospel womanhood by the power of your spirit. None of us is who we should be. Lord, all of us will fail and falter, but help us in the power of your spirit to grow, to change, and to provide a glimpse of divine beauty in this world that has gone gender neutral gray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.